believing in his word and following him. And it also serves as a warning to his audience. His audience continued to reject. How do we know they continued to reject? How do we know they truly weren't believers? Is because of the evidence of their actions. They wanted to kill the very one that they believed in. They would not listen to his word. They refused his word. And listen, it doesn't stop there. It moves from now, not just dishonor, but also doubting him. In this section right here, verses 52 to 58, which is basically a majority of this section, we see here how their insults pour into doubts and anger and frustration. I mean, they're building up to taking him to the cross. The hatred is mounting up so that when that day comes and they stand out there with the rest of the crowds and they yell, crucify him, it's full of anger and hatred and malice. They really hated the Son of God. And no matter what he did, it wasn't enough to convince them of who he was. They would keep asking for more and more miracles. And no matter what Jesus did, they still refused him. Listen, to feed 5,000 men, and not to count women and children, so it was somewhere between fifteen and 20,000 people, to feed these people miraculously like he did, and then for them to ask for a sign? You've got to be kidding me. He gave them a sign. And the ultimate sign that he was about to give them was, when you hang me on a tree, that will be the sign. Three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, and he'll resurrect. There's your sign. But what does he say? This evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. Sounds like our generation today, doesn't it? Turn on the TV, and what do you hear? Miracles nightly. Well, I could say we experience miracles nightly, daily, hourly, by the minute, by the second, just by the very fact that we keep taking in another breath. And another miracle is is that because of justification, God has not imputed to us our our unrighteousness. He has not imputed to us our sin. That's a miracle. Salvation is a miracle. Why don't we major on that? Because that's what the apostles, the prophets preached. That's what Jesus preached. Why do we have to keep preaching a prosperity gospel? It's like the preacher that went into Russia before the doors opened to go over there and to preach the gospel. And a prosperity preacher went over there and started preaching a prosperity gospel. He told them to come back the next night and that they would be prosperous. They would have all this money. And the area that he was in it was a very poor part of Russia. The people came back expecting that. It didn't happen, and so they spit on the man. Well, notice what the Jews say in verse 52 now. Well, the Jews said to him, Now we know you have a demon. Abraham died, and the prophets also, and you say, If anyone keeps my word, he will never taste of death. Surely you are not greater than our father Abraham who died. The prophets died too. Whom do you make yourself out to be? And if you'll notice, they doubted him in two ways. Number one, they doubted him by continuing to insist that he had a demon. And secondly, they doubted him by stating that if anyone keeps my word, he will never taste of death. And they ask, surely you are not greater than our father Abraham. Who do you make yourself out to be? And you know what that really translates? It translates like this. Just who do you think you are? We are physical descendants of Abraham. We are spiritual descendants of Abraham. We are children of one father. We are children of God. Who do you think you are? That's why they were throwing the insults back at him. He insulted them. But Jesus doesn't practice evil for evil. You and I struggle with that stuff. Somebody hurls something mean at us, we want to hurl it right back. And we want to hurt them. 
We want to hurt. We don't want to just get even. We want to hurt them. You attacked my pride. You attacked my character. You attacked my reputation. You're going to pay. And that's the way we act. We get cocky. Hey, don't look at me with those self-pious, righteous eyes. You know you do it. We all struggle with it. That's part of our fallenness. That's part of our Adamic nature. You get on the phone and somebody just gives you a hard time and you go, well, it's easier to do it over the phone because I don't have to look them in the face. I don't have to look them in the eyes. They don't know me. All I am to them is a number. And you just let it rip. Let it go. Well, you can see their tone is abusive. You can hear the hate in their words. And they were sure by now that he had a demon because only a demon-possessed person could make such an outlandish claim. So Jesus responds. I love his response. Look at verse 54. He says, If I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my Father who glorifies me, of whom you say he is our God. And you have not come to know him, but I know him. And if I say that I do not know him, I will be a liar like you. But I do know him and keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. If my honor is, as you say, self-fabricated, it's nothing. It's nothing. It's my father who glorifies me. And I should add to that, all disciples, all true followers of Christ glorify him as well. John Calvin says, Meanwhile, those voices sounding from heaven kiss the sun, or let all of God's angels worship him, or at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, or listen to him, or praise the Lord all you Gentiles. That should be the greatest encouragement to believers to give honor and reverence to Christ. Because we can do that. We once were no different than this crowd that he's talking to right now. And we would have hurled also those insults at him. Listen, if Jesus came today, they'd crucify him all over again. So Jesus refutes any suggestion that he has promoted himself. And the irony is, is that his opponents claim that this God as their own, but they display no knowledge of this God's profound commitment to glorify his unique son. You remember at Jesus' baptism that the Father said in Matthew 3.17, This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. Do you remember that? You remember at the transfiguration in Matthew 17 when, when Jesus was transfigured before the disciples that were there? And it says while Peter was still speaking, you remember Peter saw this and he didn't know what to say. So Peter never shut up for five seconds, and he just says anything and says, listen, it's good for us to be here. Why don't I start erecting three tabernacles? You know, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. And while he's speaking, a, a bright cloud overshadows them, and a voice comes out of heaven and says this, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. And they had the best response that a true believer should have. They fell flat on their face. They didn't do the kind of silliness that's on TBN. They didn't go on there and, hey, let me give my testimony. I just saw Jesus. I just went to heaven. I've got to come back and report there's no toilets in heaven, as one guy said. Or the people that write books and say, I spent three minutes in hell. You come back and you say you spent three minutes in hell, then I think if that really happened, you'd really be out there running all over the place and calling people to repent as you'd be warning them about this place that you had just seen. We don't get it. That kind of silliness. It's the Father who glorifies the Son. Jesus wasn't glorifying Himself. He came to do the Father's will. They claim to know this God, but Jesus says in verse 55, You have not come to know Him. And this right here just reinforces what he's already told them in verse 44, that their father was the devil. And that's some strong words. Jesus knew the father. He couldn't deny it. Or could he make a false claim 